Okay, so I'm uh, going to finish up the, the second lecture. It'll take me five, 10 minutes and then move on to the third lecture. I should have mentioned at the beginning that you can find uh, the notes for my entire mini course on the conference website uh, next to my uh, uh, abstract. Okay, anyway, so we're getting into the section about the function algebra and its connection to non-degenerate primitive item phones. So remember, we're talking about a distance regular graph gamma. We're not assuming it's a uh, cute polynomial at this point. And we've got the standard module that we have turned into the function algebra. Remember what that is. It's the vector space, which is the standard module, the V, okay, together with the entry-wise multiplication, the circle multiplication. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do in this section 10 uh, is show that a primitive idempotent E of gamma is non-degenerate if and only if uh, the eigenspace EV generates the function algebra V, generates V with respect to the function algebra product. Okay, and remember the meaning of the, uh, the, uh, the non-degenerate, uh, what it means for a primitive idempotent to be non-degenerate is that E applied to uh, the, the y hats, y, y of vertex, those vectors are mutually distinct. Uh, let's start with an arbitrary subspace U of the, the function algebra V, and let's consider the subalgebra V generated by U. Okay, now automatically it contains the bold uh, one, that's the all ones vector, just because it's a subalgebra, it contains the identity. Um, let's, and to see what else is in the subalgebra, I'm going to define a binary relation on the vertex set X uh, called U equivalent. Okay, it goes like this. So suppose you have two vertices Y and Z in X. So we'll call them U equivalent whenever for every vector U in the sub, subspace capital U, the y, coordinate, the y coordinate of u is equal to the z coordinate of u. Okay, so automatically u equivalence is an equivalence relation. And we'll be interested in the equivalence classes. Okay, now to describe, um, not right, yeah. So to, uh, to describe those equivalence classes, let me bring in some notation. For any subset y of the vertex set x, let me define y hat to be the sum of the vertices y hat where, uh, where y ranges over all the vertices in capital Y. So think of capital Y hat as the characteristic vector of the subset uh, y. Okay, lemma. So for a subspace U of V, the following are equal. The subalgebra of the function algebra V generated by U on the one hand, and on the other hand, the span of the y, capital Y hats, Y a U equivalence relation. So in other words, the, uh, the characteristic vectors of the equivalence classes of this U equivalence, they form a, a basis for the subalgebra of the function algebra V generated by the U. Okay, so um, I wrote out a, a a proof. It's it's just a, a, a playing around with linear algebra a little bit. I think I won't go through the details. Little exercise. Okay, and uh, the upshot, a corollary of that, uh, is that for a subspace U of V, the following are equivalent. Uh, U generates the function algebra V on the one hand, and on the other hand, every U equivalence class has cardinality one. All right, now we've been discussing a generic subspace U of V. Let's now consider the special case where U is an eigenspace for the graph. So in other words, U is equal to E V, where V or E where E is some primitive eigenpotent of the graph. Okay, let's compute the E V equivalence classes. So remember E E V, it's the span of the E W hats W of vertex. Okay, and earlier we saw that for any two vertices Y and Z, Y coordinate of E Z hat is the same thing as the Z coordinate of E Y hat. They're both equal to the Y Z entry of E. All right, so uh, suppose E is now uh, any primitive idempotent of the graph, that for vertices Y and Z, the following are equivalent. Y and Z are in the same E V equivalence class. 
on the one hand, and on the other hand, EY hat is equal to EZ hat. And um, so the proof just follows from basic stuff and the comment at the end of the previous slide. Okay, now we get to the main point. Uh, if E is a primitive item potent of the graph, then the following are equivalent. On the one hand, EV generates the function algebra V, generates V in the function algebra. And on the other hand, uh, E is non-degenerate. Okay, and why exactly? Well, we have the logical implications uh, that EV generates the function algebra V if and only if the EV equivalence classes all have uh, cardinality one. Okay, if and only if P y hats, y a vertex, those vectors are mutually distinct, if and only if E is non-degenerate. So that takes me to the end of uh, lecture two. Let's take a 10 second break. Okay, moving on to the my third unit. Here are the topics that I'll be discussing next. So the Q polynomial property and ASCII Wilson duality, the function algebra again, characterization of the Q polynomial property, the irreducible T modules and the tridiagonal pairs, recurrent sequences and the tridiagonal relations. Okay, now we've been hearing uh, quite a bit already about the Q polynomial property. Now I'm ready to uh, get into it um, in, in a formal way. So, okay, same setup as before. We're, we're working with a distance regular graph gamma, diameter at least three. We've got the primitive item components, the EIs, I zero to D. Okay, I defined the, um, the ordering of EI of the primitive item points. I call that ordering Q polynomial. Okay, whenever the following hold for any H, I, and J zero to D, uh, Q H I J is zero if one of H I and J is greater than the sum of the other two. And Q H I J is non-zero whenever H I one of H I and J is equal to the sum of the other two. And this is uh, meant to you know, match what happens for the intersection numbers of a distance regular graph. We saw that earlier. Okay, and then we'll say that the graph itself is Q polynomial whenever there exists at least one. Q polynomial ordering of the primitive item points of the graph. Could be more than one. For any given distance regular graph, there, there might be none, there might be one, there might be more than one Q polynomial ordering of the primitive item points. Okay, the graph is Q polynomial if there's at least one. All right, now for the rest of the, this section, I'm gonna assume we're given a Q polynomial ordering, EI, I zero to D of the primitive item points. Okay, now mimicking what we did with the intersection numbers, now working with prime parameters for Q polynomial, let's, let's abbreviate CI star for QI1, I minus one. Okay, just like we, uh, we def defined CI for, uh, to equal PI1, I minus one earlier. Okay, and then similarly, AI star is QI1, I, uh, BI star is QI1, I plus one. A naught star is zero, C1 star is one automatically. The, the CI stars, BI stars are positive. CI star plus AI star plus BI star is equal to M1, which recall is the dual of the, the K1 or the K, the valency from before. C naught star is zero, BD star is zero. Okay, and then um, using a special case of some identities we saw earlier, MI times CI star is equal to MI minus one times BI minus one star. And iterating, we get this formula for the uh, multiplicities MI as a product, B naught star, B one star up to BI minus one star divided by C one star, C two star up to CI star. Now let's bring in um, the subconstituent algebra. Let's fix a base vertex now and write T, T of X like we, we've been doing before. Okay, now recall the, uh, the basis for our dual Bose-Mesner algebra, the AI star basis and the EI star basis. Let me abbreviate A star for A1 star and call that the dual adjacency matrix of the graph with respect to the base vertex X and the given Q polynomial ordering. Okay, now my next goal is to show that AI star is a polynomial of degree I in A star for every I is to D. Okay, so for so we have uh, as you see there, a star times a i star uh, is a linear combination of b i minus one star, a i minus one star plus a i star capital a i star plus c i plus one star, a i plus one star. That's for i one to d minus one, and it looks a little different at i equals d. 
that's just a special case of the 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 main um, uh, product equation. A i star a j star is the sum of h q h i j a h star. It's just that equation with j equals one. Okay, now back at the p polynomial uh, discussion, we had some polynomials, the vi, and then the other normalization, the ui. At this q polynomial level, we have uh, roughly analogous polynomials, which we'll call the vi stars and the ui stars. Find the vi stars, i zero to e plus one, uh, just like we did with the, the vi's, except now we'll use the crime parameters instead of the intersection numbers. Find v not star to be one. V one star is the is the argument lambda, and and uh, and then we have this recursion lambda v i star is v i minus one star v i minus one star plus a i star v i star plus c i plus one star v i plus one star. Okay, and the the c d plus one star is declared to equal one. Okay, and then uh, continuing on, just like we saw in the p polynomial case. Um, or this the distance regular graph case, we see that the degrees of the VI stars are I. The coefficient, the highest coefficient of VI star is C1 star, the inverse of C1 star of C2 star up to CI star. Uh, VI star applied to A star is equal to AI star, I zero to D. And VD plus one star uh, of A star is equal to zero. Okay, then we immediately see from that that the uh, dual Boltzmann's algebra, the M star is generated by A star. And also the minimal polynomial of A star is a scalar multiple of that VD plus one star, uh, the, the multiple being C1 star, C2 star up to CD star. Okay, now let's bring in the eigenvalues of the uh, A star, the dual adjacency matrix. From what we had before, a star is the sum over is m m one times the sum over i of u i applied to theta one e i star. Okay, let's abbreviate theta i star for that coefficient there m m one u u i of theta one. So that a star becomes the sum over i zero to d of just theta i star e i star. Okay, now we recognize that uh, those theta i stars are going to be eigenvalues for a star, but at this point. Uh, before we go further, we, it's not clear if those theta i stars are mutually distinct or not. It'll turn out that they are, but that's something we need to prove. Okay, so lemma. Uh, so the following whole, the polynomial vd plus one star has d plus one mutually distinct roots, uh, namely the theta i stars, i zero to d. Also, the eigenspaces of the a star are the subconstituents, the e i star v's, i zero to d, i zero to d. Theta i star is the eigenvalue of a star associated with the i the e i star v eigenspace. Okay, that those claims are all immediate from the previous uh, lemma and corollary. All right, now for i zero to d, I'll call theta i star the i dual eigenvalue of the graph with respect to the given q polynomial structure. Okay, so we've been talking about the v i star polynomials. Let's bring in a second normalization, the the u i stars. Okay, meant to uh, analogs of the UIs. So we'll define UI star to be VI star divided by MI. Okay, so the recursion for the UI stars looks as follows. U naught star is the ident is one. U one star is uh, lambda divided by M one. And then lambda UI star is CI star UI minus one star plus AI star UI star plus BI star UI plus one star I, I one to D minus one. And then it looks a little different at i. Okay, so just like what we saw for the UIs, except now there are stars everywhere. Okay, now let's consider how the uh, uh, the UIs and the UI stars are related. Uh, from what we've said so far, there's no particular reason to think that they're related at all. But in fact, we've got this uh, remarkable theorem due to Del Sutt going back to 1973 that goes like this. For any i and j zero to d, ui applied to theta j is equal to uj star applied to theta i star. So that's called S. Wilson duality or sometimes called Delsart duality. And it's easy to prove uh, from what we've built up already. Uh, let's take a look. U ui applied to theta j e i star the same thing is uh, the inverse of mj times uh, aj star ei star at earlier. 
Now that AJ star is a polynomial in A star, the polynomial being of BJ stars. We got MJ inverse BJ star of A star applied to, uh, or, not, or times e, e I star. Okay, now that VJ star divided by MJ, that's that's U, that's the UJ star polynomial. So we got UJ star applied to A star times EI star. Okay, but A, A star uh, times EI star is uh, just theta I star EI star. And then we bring in a polynomial of A star, it's just gonna be the polynomial applied to EI, uh, theta I star. So UJ star applied to theta I star times EI. Okay, so if we compare the coefficients of the left-hand side, right-hand side, we see that uh, they match up as ui theta j is equal to uj star theta i star. These special cases, um, for i, vi star applied to theta naught star is just mi, ui star applied to theta naught star is just, just one. Okay, that's immediate from Aski where it's a duality um, and the E equation V i star is equal to M i U i. Okay, now earlier we obtained some orthogonality relations involving the U i or the V i. Uh, next, let's uh, work out the analogous orthogonality relations for the U i star and the V i star. Okay, they look like this. So for the U i, um, so remember we got two versions, row, row orthogonality and column orthogonality. Uh, for the first version we got for i, I and j zero to d, the sum over L, of ui star applied to theta l star, uj star applied to theta l star kl is equal to the Kronecker delta ij mi inverse times x. And then the other one reads the sum over l, ul star applied to theta i star, ul star applied to theta j star ml is equal to delta ij ki inverse times x. And these equations, we could get them from scratch, but it's easier at this point to simply apply ASCII-Wilson duality to the orthogonality relations for the UI. We just uh, transform the UI into the UI star using ASCII-Wilson duality. Okay, and then we could ask, well, what do the orthogonality relations look like in terms of the VI stars? And uh, and there, and you, you see them there. I've just taken the, the relations on the previous slide and eliminated the UI stars using the equation VI stars, VI star equals MI UI star. Okay, so the gist of it is that, uh, you know, ev everything that happened for the UI and the VI, uh, something very similar is happening for the UI star and the VI star. Now, there's a, a, a famous theorem called Leonard's theorem, due to Doug Leonard going back to 1982. Uh, Doug Leonard was a graduate student at Ohio State University. Uh, working with uh, Aichi Benai and Tatsuro Ito around that time. And uh, while he was there, he uh, classified all the orthogonal polynomial sequences that satisfied ascii wilson duality. And his version was, um, it's kind of quick and dirty. And, and uh, a little bit later, Benai and Ito gave much more comprehensive uh, treatment in their book on algebraic combinatorics association schemes. And the comprehensive version, the classification, uh, shows that all the orthogonal polynomial sequences that satisfy ASCII-Wilson duality belong to the so-called terminating branch of the ASCII scheme. In this ASCII scheme, you've got uh, several, think of it as a huge partially ordered set with several uh, connected components. Uh, in the for the main component, you've got the ASCII-Wilson polynomials at the very top, and then down below, you've got all the limiting cases uh, involving basically all the orthogonal polynomial sequences that are sort of famous enough to have names: Charlie, Laguerre, Hermy, Lejean, or what have you. Anything that you can name. So that the main branch corresponds to the polynomial sequences that are infinite in extent. And then you've got this terminating branch that corresponds to the polynomial sequences that are finite in extent. They have a natural, the polynomial sequence has a natural stopping point. Okay, that's the terminating branch. And sitting at the top of the terminating branch, we've got the q rakoff polynomials. And then down below the limiting cases, Han, dual Han, uh, Krauchik, uh, dual Krauchik, uh, uh, q Krauchik, quantum affine, very various versions of Krauchik and Raka. Okay, anyway. The, the theory of Leonard pairs that I developed uh, so, somewhat later uh, provides a modern approach to the uh, the theory of ASCII-Wilson duality. Okay, now let me get into the 
function algebra characterization of the Q polynomial property. So what I'm going to do is characterize the, the Q polynomial property uh, using the function algebra setup. Okay, so I'm still talking about this distance regular graph with diameter at least three. Uh, I'm not assuming up front that the graph is Q polynomial. Okay, and I'm going to be talking about the function algebra V and the primitive item bones, the EI. Okay, let me remind you about some notation. If you have any subspaces R and S of V, then R circle S means the span of the of the products R, R, lowercase R circle S, where R is anything in R and S is anything in S. Okay, we'll be iterating. Take, take any non-negative integer N and a subspace R, R to the circle power N, means r circle r circle r etc n times okay and if n is zero r r circle zeros uh, we'll just interpret that to be the span of the uh the all ones vector okay that one dimensional space <laughs> so the theorem goes like this so the following are equivalent so on the one hand the ordering uh ei it's q polynomial and then secondly, uh, E1 is non-degenerate. And for I0 to D, E1V circle EIV is in the sum of the EI minus 1V plus EIV plus EI plus 1V. Okay, and then thirdly, for I0 to D, the, the sum over L, 0 to I of ELV, so the sum of the first L, the I plus 1 eigenspaces, okay, is equal to the sum over L zero to I of the L circle powers of the E1V, okay, zero to I. So, um, you know, e E1V circle zero, so the span of the all ones vector plus E1V itself plus E1V circle E1V, et cetera, up to E1V circle uh, L, you know, to the power circle L. Um, Let's let's walk through the proof uh, carefully. It's uh, it's rather interesting. So going from one to two, so we're assuming it's two polynomial now. Uh, remember the dual eigenvalues. The theta i's are are um, at, uh, you know theta, theta i star is at m one u u i applied to theta one for i zero to d, and uh, that q polynomial, you know, because it's q polynomial, those theta i stars are mutually distinct. And so in particular, theta i star is not equal to theta naught star. And that's enough to make the, the E1 non-degenerate. OK, and then we also need that uh, three-term recurrence. Um, so earlier, we saw that e, E1v circle EIv is equal to the sum of the EHvs, the, the H ranging over 0 to D, QH, QH1i is not equal to 0. But because we're assuming the EI's ordering is Q polynomial, that crime parameter QH1I is just going to be zero if H and I differ by more than one sum involving H. There's really just three terms, the I minus one term, the I term, and the I plus one term. Okay, and that gives you. Yeah, you need the I plus one term to show up, so we're using You're not using the fact that Q1I I plus one is positive. You're using the fact that it's non-degenerate. So, sure that term goes up, right? so, there, so that's what the non-degenerate okay. uh, aspect is, is all about. Okay. So um, yeah, so that second condition says that E1 is non-degenerate. Uh, that's saying in disguise that the E, the, the e plus 1V term actually shows up in the, in the three-term recurrence. Okay. okay, now going from two to three, so we got the non-degeneracy, we got the three-term recurrence, and then we get, we want to get that uh, that functional equation. Uh, how do we do that? But for every i zero to d, let's define capital P i to be the sum over L zero to i of e one v to the power circle. Just up front, we know that that P i is going to be a sum of some of some of the eigenspaces. Uh, that is to say, some subset SI of the uh, set of indices 0, 1 up to D uh, such that PI is equal to the sum over all the elements H and SI of EHV. Okay, so we're using there the uh, that camera. Uh, all right, now we want to show that SI is equal to the set 0, 1 up to I. 
it would basically by induction s naught is equal to zero and s one is consists of zero and one just automatically okay and um also by the three term recurrence in part two capital s i it's contained in the set zero one up to i for i zero to d and also by construction s i minus one is contained in s i Okay, so if we can just show that SI minus one is not actually equal to SI, we'll be done. SI minus one by induction will, will consist of zero, one up to I minus one. And then SI uh, is contained in zero, one up to I. If it's if we can just show it's not equal to SI minus one, then it's gotta contain I, and so it's gotta be exactly equal to zero, one up to I. Now, uh, suppose, uh, SI minus one uh, did equal SI, that would mean that uh, that P the PI minus one equal the PI, but that would force the uh, PI minus one, well, that, uh, yeah, that would force the PI minus one uh, to be invariant under the E1V because E1V circle, any, 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 uh, 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 it, contribution to the PI minus one is back, back in PI minus one. Normally it would be in pi, but because pi minus one is assumed to be pi minus one, it's back in pi minus one. Okay, so you got this uh, this generator of v, the e one v, um, uh, leaving invariant the pi minus one. The only way that could happen is if pi minus one is already equal to v. Uh, but in that case, the the si minus one is would have to consist of all the indices zero one up to d. But that contradicts the the fact or you know, our setup that SI minus one is contained in zero one up to I minus one. Okay, so we got a contradiction unless uh, the uh, SI minus one is not equal to SI and that gives us what we want. And then going uh, from three to one, so here we have that, we're assuming that functional equation, we want to show the graph is Q polynomial. Um, Let's uh, look at it this way. So for i and for i zero to d and j zero to d minus i, we want to show that uh, the Klein parameter q q super i plus j uh, i j is non-zero, and also q h i j is equal to zero if h is bigger than i plus j. Okay. Now from the functional equation, we have that uh, the following two sums. If we take their circle product, first sum is e naught v plus e one v up to e i v, and the second sum is e zero z plus e one v up to e j v. If we take the circle product of those two sums, okay, we get e naught v plus e one v up to e i plus j v. That's straight from the assumption in part three. Now that uh, immediately implies that Q H I J is zero if H is bigger than I plus J. And also, if we look more carefully, we're gonna get the, the inequality that we need. We see that for there, there must exist some R zero to I and some S zero to J, uh, such that the Q super I, I plus J R S is non-zero, because some, somehow we ended up with the, the E I plus J V on, on the right hand side that had to come from the circle product of you know, some, some you know some some eigenspace uh, e, e not v up to e i v circling with uh, some eigenspace e zero v up to e j v so it came from some eigenspace e r v circle uh, e s v okay but just from the construction the r is at most i and the and the, the j the s is at most j but then what we from what we concluded in the first part of the argument uh, the R has to actually equal the I and the, and the S has to equal the J. So our Q I plus J R S, which is non-zero, it's actually Q I plus J sub I J. And, and that's non-zero, that's what we wanted to show. All right, now let's uh, talk about irreducible T modules and tridiagonal pairs. Okay, so now for, for this unit, I'm going to assume that the graph is Q polynomial with respect to the given ordering E I, I zero to D of the primitive item bones. And let's fix the base vertex x and consider this subconstituent algebra ttx. Okay, I'm gonna argue the main the main goal here is to show that the a a star pair act on each irreducible t module as a tridiagonal pair. Okay, now the first observation is that t is generated by just a and a star. By the definition, it was generated by m and m star, the both algebra and its dual, but 
the bosons and algebra are generated by A, and it's dual is generated by A star. Okay, now let's uh, review a few points. The eigenspaces of the A are the EIVs, I0 to D, I0 to D. Theta I is the eigenvalue of A associated with the EIV. The eigenspaces of the A star are the EI star Vs, I0 to D. And for I0 to D, the, uh, the theta I star is the eigenvalue of A star associated with EI star V. Also, we, we, we saw earlier that for I0 to D, A applied to EI star V is in the sum of EI minus one star V plus EI star V plus EI plus one star V. Okay, and then what's missing in the discussion so far is the dual to that. Okay, here's the lemma that for I0 to D, A star applied to EIV is contained in the sum of EI minus one V plus EI V plus EI plus one V. Okay, and the proof is easy at this point. That's just a special case of uh, an inclusion that we saw earlier. Uh, as you see there for I and J zero to D, AI star applied to EJV is contained in the sum of the EHVs H zero to D, QHIJ non-zero. Okay, so we're, we're just taking uh, the, the I to be one. A, A one star is just A star and using the fact that the prime parameters Q, H, 1, J are zero, if H and J differ by one and one. So they'll just be three terms in that sum on the right-hand side. Now, um, we saw way back in section two that the standard module V is an orthogonal direct sum of irreducible T modules. Let's take one of those irreducible T modules, call it W, and um, Observe that W is an orthogonal direct sum of the non-zero spaces amongst the EI star Ws. And similarly, W is an orthogonal direct sum of the non-zero subspaces amongst the EI W. Next uh, observation. So letting W still be an irreducible T module. For I is there to D, A applied to EI star W is contained in the sum of EI minus one star W plus EI star W plus EI plus one star W. Okay, and the dual A star applied to EIW is in the sum of EI minus one W plus EIW plus EI plus one W. No big surprise here. We saw earlier that this happened with W equaling V. What I'm saying here is a consequence of that and the fact that W is invariant under the A and the A star. Now, at um, this point, it's not entirely clear um, which, you know, given our irreducible T module W, uh, which EI Ws are R0 and, uh, and which EI Ws are R0? What we can say, you know, straight off is that some, you know, some uh, out, out of the candidates, e, e not W, E1 W up to E D W, some, some subset of those are, are going to be non-zero, but what can we say about the, the nature of that subset? Okay, quite a bit, it turns out. So let W be an irreducible T module. Uh, the endpoint of W, I will define to be the minimum I for which EI star W is non-zero. And the diameter of W, I'll define to be one less than the total number of I's for which EI star W is non-zero. Okay. And then on the dual side, same sort of thing. The dual endpoint of W will be the minimum I for which the EI W is non-zero. And the dual diameter will be the one less than the, the total number of I's for which the EI W is non-zero. Okay. Now, back to this question of which uh, EIWs, EI star Ws are non-zero. Uh, the non-zero ones form an interval. So it goes like this. So let W be an irreducible T module with endpoint rho and diameter D. Okay. Then, of course, rho and D are non-negative integers, and rho plus D is at most the diameter capital D. That's just from the construction. Okay, and then on to the main point. EI star W is non-zero if and only if I is between rho and rho plus D. And W is the direct sum or orthogonal direct sum over I from rho to rho plus D of EI star W. Okay, so in other words, the, the, uh, the set of uh, non-zero um, EI star Ws forms an interval in the list of, of uh, candidates zero, zero to D. It starts at some location rho, and uh, at that point you get a sequence of non-zero um, sum ands, and then it stops at rho plus. And then 
Okay, I, I wrote out a proof, but I, I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, and then on the dual side, the same sort of thing happens. Let W again be an irreducible T module uh, with the endpoint tau or dual endpoint tau now and dual diameter delta. And then again, tau, tau and delta are non negative integers. Tau, tau plus delta is at most the diameter. And then for every i zero to d, EIW is non zero if and only if i is between the tau and the tau plus the delta. So the upshot is that VW is the direct sum, orthogonal direct sum of over i from tau to tau plus delta of the EIWs. Okay, now we get to the main point. The pair AA star acts as on each irreducible T module as a trinidigital pair. Okay, and that is um, immediate now from uh, what I've said on the previous slides and the definition of a triadagonal pair that I mentioned in the, in the very first talk. So I'll just talk, talk my way through the, the definition of a triadagonal pair. You've got your two diagonalizable linear transformations, the A and the A star. And then we require that there's an ordering of the eigenspaces of A, V0, uh, V1 up to VD. Okay, such that for every i, a star applied to vi is in the sum of vi minus one plus vi plus vi plus one. Okay, it's the same sort of thing with a and the a star interchanged. And then we've got an irreducibility condition. Now, in this context, the, ir the irreducibility is automatic from the fact that we're taking an irreducible t module to start with. t is generated by a and a star. Okay, so of course that module is. Um, irreducible as a module for the A and A star. Okay, and then the, uh, the two main inclusions are immediate from uh, what I showed you on the previous slides. A, A star applied to EIW is contained in EI minus one W plus EIW plus EI plus one W and so. All right, now uh, as a co corollary to that theorem, uh, we can uh, draw the following conclusion. Let W be an irreducible T module. And the diameter of W is equal to the dual diameter of W. Um, so where am I getting that? So I mentioned in my first lecture that for any tridiagonal pair, the diameter is equal to the dual diameter. That's um, a non-trivial fact, and I will give a proof of it in my in my fifth lecture on Friday. I'll prove it. I'll, in that lecture, I'll talk about general tridiagonal pairs, and I'll show you a proof of the uh, the, the equality of the, the diameter and the dual diameter. Uh, it's kind of amusing. The When I first got into this, I assumed that it, it was easy to show that the diameter equaled the dual diameter. And I played around with it for a, a short while and then a longer while and a very long while. And I was not able to come up with any proof and I got more and more embarrassed that I was somehow missing something obvious. Uh, some years went by before I finally understood um, why it was that the diameter equaled the full diameter. Uh, it has to do with, you have to bring in this so-called the split decomposition, which took me multi-years to discover. But anyway, the proof I'll show you on Friday uses that split decomposition. Okay, anyway, the, so the bottom line is it's a, it's a highly non-trivial fact that the diameter equals the dual diameter. Okay, now let's see. just just a minute. Let me just check. All right, so we've just seen that the irreducible T modules give tridiagonal pairs. What can we uh, conclude about the irreducible T modules based on that observation? Project of describing the irreducible T modules is ongoing. By no means have we, uh, in some sense, completely described them. Um, there are many. Um, issues that uh, remain outstanding. For a summary of sort of the state of the art, uh, I recommend a very recent book um, by uh, H.E. Benai, Hetsiko Benai, and Tatsuo Ito, and Ri Tanaka called Algebraic Combinatorics. So in that book, they talk about the special cases, they talk about what, what you can say in general and so on. In that book and in the literature in general, uh, there are detailed results about many special cases, uh, such as uh, the, the graph gamma being bipartite, or almost bipartite, or dual bipartite, or almost dual bipartite, or so-called two homogeneous. Uh, there's a type of uh, 
ERG called tight, hypercubes, new graphs, Johnson graphs, Grassman graphs, dual polar graphs, or the graph having a spin model in the Bose-Mesner algebra. So these special cases uh, have been worked out in, in the, some, some detail. Okay, now let me talk about uh, recurrent sequences. Um, this is a short section uh, designed to remind you about sequences of scalars that satisfy a three-term recurrence. Okay, so for this section only, we're gonna put graphs aside and just talk about sequences of scalars. All right, so in this sequence, uh, in this uh, unit, uh, D is an integer at least three, and theta i, i is zero to D, is uh, just any sequence of real scalars. Now, let me uh, bring in three parameters, beta, gamma, and delta, three, three real scalars. So we'll say that our sequence is recurrent whenever theta i minus one is not equal to theta i for i two to d minus one. And that ratio that you see there, theta i minus two minus theta i plus one divided by theta i minus one minus theta i, that is independent of i for i two to d minus one. Okay, that's recurrent. And then we'll say, we'll say that our sequence is beta recurrent whenever the uh, that sum that you see there is zero for i two to d minus one. So the sum reads theta i minus two minus beta plus one theta i minus one plus beta plus one theta i minus theta i plus one. Okay, that's zero for i two to d minus one. That's beta recurrent. Okay, and then we'll say that our sequence is beta gamma recurrent whenever theta i minus one minus beta theta i plus theta i plus one is equal to gamma for i one to d minus one. And fourthly, we'll say that our sequence is beta gamma delta recurrent whenever um, theta i minus one squared minus beta theta i minus one theta i plus theta i squared minus gamma theta i minus one plus theta i is a constant, uh, the, the delta for i one to d. Okay, so we have uh, this handful of uh, different versions of, uh, of the, the main recurrence. Okay, and those versions are all essentially equivalent to each other. And I wanna, they're not exactly the same, but they're very close to each other. I wanna run through just how it is that they're related. Okay, so firstly, the, uh, the following are equivalent. The, the theta i sequence is recurrent. On the one hand, that's equivalent to uh, the, the uh, scalars uh, theta i minus one not equal not equal to theta i for i two to d minus one, and there exists a beta such that the theta i is beta recurrence. The theta i sequence is beta recurrence. Okay, so uh, except for the inequality, the recurrent and beta recurrent are, are essentially the same thing. Okay, now given a beta, uh, the following are equivalent: the sequence theta i is beta recurrent. On the one hand, on the other hand, there exists a gamma such that the sequence theta i is beta gamma recurrent. Okay, moving up the chain. Uh, the following are equivalent, given scalars beta and gamma. Uh, firstly, suppose the theta i sequence is beta gamma recurrent, then there exists a delta such that the sequence is beta gamma delta recurrent. Okay, and going the other way, supposing that the sequence is beta gamma delta recurrent, and that theta i minus one is not equal to theta i plus one for i one to d minus one, then the theta i sequence is beta gamma recurrent. Yep. Okay, and then one, one more point for measure of use. Suppose we're given three scalars, beta gamma delta, and let's assume that our theta i sequence is beta gamma delta recurrent. Okay, then for every i zero to d, we have this identity, two minus beta times theta i squared, minus two gamma theta i minus delta uh, has a factorization into the product theta i minus theta i minus one times theta i minus theta i plus one. Okay, where at the end, if i is equal to zero or i equals d, uh, we're discussing theta minus one or theta d plus one. Those are defined so that the uh, equation you see there, theta i minus one minus beta theta i plus theta i plus one is equal to gamma. Uh, that equation holds at i equals zero or i equals d. So setting i equals zero, that defines for us uh, the meaning of theta minus one 
and setting I equals D, it defines for us theta D plus one. Now let's get into the uh, the tridiagonal relation. Okay, so we're back to discussing a distance regular graph gamma, the diameter at least three. We've got our primitive eigenpoints, which we will assume is Q polynomial, or the, the, that ordering is Q polynomial. Let's fix a base vertex X and consider the subconstituent algebra T, T, T of X. Okay, and I'm going to argue that the A and the A star satisfy a pair of relations called the tridiagonal relations. Okay, and I'm also going to obtain a recurrence in, involving the eigenvalues and the dual eigenvalues. Okay, let me state up front uh, the two main results. So there, there exist real numbers, beta, gamma, gamma star, delta, and delta star, such that uh, zero is equal to the commutator of A and the expression you see there, A squared A star minus beta A A star A plus A star A squared minus gamma A A star plus A star A minus delta A star. Okay, so that first equation is simply saying that A commutes with the expression I just read out. Okay, and then so that's the first tridiagonal relation. And the second one is, uh, is the dual obtained by interchanging the A and the A star. Okay, and the leaving the beta alone and, and uh, interchanging the gamma gamma star, rho rho star. Okay, so those two equations, those are the tridiagonal relations, the two tridiagonal relations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the second uh, main theorem is due to Leonard going back to 1982, part of his. Uh, his classification of, or, you know, part of his study of ascii wilson duality, mm -hmm. um, it goes like this. The scalars, uh, which you, as you see there, the fractions theta i minus two minus theta i plus one divided by theta i minus one minus theta i, okay, and the dual, those uh, ratios are equal and independent of i for i two to d minus one. Okay, so in other words, um, the, the eigenvalue sequence is recurrent, uh, the dual eigenvalue sequence is recurrent, and, the, and uh, so they are beta recurrent using the same beta, is what, what this is all saying. Okay, so I'm going to um, give you a relatively short proof. Mm -hmm. uh, not, uh, I'm not, not going to be able to finish it today, I just have a few more minutes, but let me at least get started. Okay, so to get started, here's some triple product relations that are you might view as sort of variations on what we've already seen. So it goes like this, for i, j, and r, zero to d, uh, e, i star, a to the rth power, e, j star, is zero if r is less than the difference between i and j, and it's non-zero if r is equal to the difference between i and j. And then we have the dual set up, e, e i a star to the rth power, e j, is the same sort of thing, zero or non-zero, depending on whether r is less than or equal to the difference between i and j. Okay, so these equations or inequalities, uh, like I said, variations on the, the actual triple product relations uh, come about as follows. Let's just look at the first part. Second part is just the same. So what we saw, from the actual triple product relations is that E i star A sub R, the rth distance matrix, E j star is equal to zero, if and only if the intersection of a P I, P I R j is equal to zero. Okay, but A sub R is a polynomial in A with degree exactly R, and also P, the intersection of a P I R j, that is zero if R is less than the difference between I and J, and it's non-zero if R is equal to the difference between I and J. Put those facts together, out pops the equa equations and the inequalities that I'm claiming in this lemma. I see I'm out of time. So maybe that would be a good place to, to stop. So next time I'm going to go through a sequence of uh, little ingredient re results that I'm going to use to prove the, the tridiagonal relations. Okay, let me stop there. Can you explain uh, the meaning of the D, D generation of the pre-tridiagonal? 
Yeah. Oh, what 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 does it mean for a primitive mind important to be non-degenerate? Non-degenerate. Okay, so there there were a couple of uh, there points of view. Um, so one point of view is that you take E, you apply it to all the vertices, or what I should say is the vectors representing the vertices, the Y hats. So these are the column vectors with a single one in location Y and then zeros everywhere else. You apply E to those vectors and the, res and the resulting vectors are mutually distinct. That's what happens when E is non-degenerate. Okay, another way of looking at it, take your E and uh, write it out as a linear combination of the distance matrices. Let's just say theta I star is the, uh, the, I, the coefficient of AI. So what's required for non-degeneracy is that theta, those coefficients are all, the, the, the theta I star is different from theta naught star for every I one to D. It's a little bit weaker than requiring that the theta I stars are mutually distinct we're just requiring that the non-trivial ones are not equal to the, the theta naught star. Anything else? Okay, very good, thank you.